My people, welcome to you and I talk show with your favorite host, Louise Uachu. We're back, a new episode, speaking to writers. It's going to be great stories in Vancouver happening. So if you're a writer, you should tune in. If you love writers, if you love writing or spoken word, this is the show for you. It's going to be fun. Welcome to the show, my people. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. You and I, you and I, you and I talk. Louise Wachu Imana and Wachu Productions. Welcome to the show. Today we're talking about Vancouver Story Slam with the people who are responsible for it, especially you, Suzanne Cormier, and uh, your fiancé, he is Bryant Ross. Actually, there's five of us who are involved, mm -hmm. three of our colleagues who are not with us here today. Mm -hmm. There's also Rhonda Milne, mm -hmm. uh, Tim Tanner, and Clint Wilson. Okay. It's a team of the five of us. I'm in charge of the organization and the promotion. Shout out to all those people. <laughs> they are wonderful. They are wonderful. Shouldn't they work very though. hard. Yes. Exactly. So, Suzanne, how did you start getting involved with the Vancouver Story Slam? I mean, it's been going on for, for a while, and many people like it. I mean, it's, it's an important thing to bring writers together. How did you get it started? Um, we didn't actually start it. Uh, we came on later on. Mm -hmm. um, Vancouver Story Slam's been running for 11 years. It was started by two local writers, um, Johnny Frem and Sean McGarrigal. Uh, to bring together storytellers of all kinds, not just professional storytellers, but also the average guy who just had a great story to tell. Um, it went through a couple of different uh, versions of different people organizing it and running it. Bryant and I were both regular competitors. He's been the Story Slam champion two years uh, in 2009, and he's currently the Vancouver Story Slam 2015 champion. Uh -huh. And at one point in time, the Clint and Rhonda and Tim were running it, just the three of them. And they decided to back off a little and let us get on board. And we jumped on board, and now it's the five of us running it, with uh -huh. Bryant is now running the, ho the hosting, and I'm doing the promotion. Because nice. we believed in it so strongly that we just wanted to bring it out to more people. So what happened to the people who uh, started it? They didn't want to be involved anymore? Uh, they were involved in it for quite a while, but mm -hmm. it does take quite a bit of work. Mm -hmm. And um, John uh, got involved in some other things. He does a lot of performance art. And Sean took over running or being heavily involved in Vancouver Poetry Slam. So you can only juggle so many things at once, as you yourself know. You've got to sort of pick and choose and hand off. Maybe some I don't know projects. yet. <laughs> yeah, so. that's nice. Um, so, what is it about Vancouver Story Slam that really attracted you, and why did you feel like you have to keep it going? It's the sense of community, the people coming together and sharing stories. Not. Not everyone who is a writer thinks that they're a writer. Some people say, I'm a writer, I like to write. But not everybody who has stories to tell and to share with the world necessarily recognizes that into, unto themselves. And Vancouver Story Slam is one of those very few places where people can come together and say, I have a story. Mm. And I want to share it with you folks, as opposed to, I am a writer and here are my credentials and publications. Yeah, because you do have a lot of credentials. Let me just name a, a few. You're a multimedia writer, you're an artist, and you have won or been shortlisted for CBC's National Literary Award, for the ARC magazine's uh, Poem of the Year, and the Federation of BC, I mean, a lot of things. <laughs> Yeah, I've had, I've had a few things in, in bits and pieces and yeah. uh, a bunch of anthologies and whatnot, but that's not necessarily what means what you need to have in order to be considered a writer mm -hmm. that people like to listen to. Mm -hmm. You can just be a person who has something interesting to say and you're good with words. So you don't have to have all the credentials like you have. 
No, I mean Bryant has been the uh, storytelling champion two years running, and he or two years, uh -huh. and he's the host. And how, how much? Have you... I'm, yeah, I have no credentials. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I like telling stories. I I got involved in it in 2006, uh, but as far as published works, no. Mm -hmm. you, so you Bryant. Story in the newspaper once. I, I had a couple of stories in a newspaper article once, but that was about. In your real life, you're a fire chief. My real life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a district fire chief. A yeah, the township, township of Langley Fire Department. Yes. So it, this is like you like to put fire out, but then you're starting fires when you're telling stories. I mean, how how we how is we that? We don't ever say we start. Fire. Okay. <laughs> No. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it is a lot different than my day job, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and so what attracts you? I mean, is it because it's so hectic, the, the other job that writing or storytelling becomes chilling or relaxing? I mean... Uh, well, part of it is that, you know, storytelling runs in my family. I mean, it's from my grandfather to my father and the stories I've told my children. But I think one of the one of the real attractions for me is that this is so much different than than what I than than, than my regular job. It's just it's just such a, a departure from what I normally do. Yeah. Um, and it's it's and it's something that you know I've had some success at. So it's uh, it's and and really the the group of people the the, the group of storytellers that we have is such a, a, a good and friendly, welcoming bunch of people that it's, it's really a lot of fun. It's, it's, when I'm hosting the, the Story Slam, that's one of the things I say to the crowd is that this is not easy to do, but it's, it's a huge amount of fun. Yeah. <laughs> it All is right, really let's not. take a, a, a really short, uh, quick break, and then we'll come back and keep talking about it. You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uachu.com to be a guest on the show. Welcome back to the show, my people. So we're talking about fires, real fires, and then fires in writing or in speaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you must be one of those people that don't have uh, stage fright. I mean, what are you going to be scared going in, in front of people versus fire? How, how is that? Well, you know, uh, in the fire service, uh, I spent a lot of time as an instructor, as, as a, a training officer. And one of my mentors at the time, one of my mentors that I worked with, uh, when we were teaching other firefighters to be instructors, one of the things we always said was, we get butterflies just like you do, only we've taught ours to fly in formation. <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 I'm nervous, I just ask Susan, I'm nervous and, and wound up to, before I get on stage, just like anybody. Mm -hmm. It's just that I'm a little more accustomed to it. Mm. So this is nice. How is it working together uh, as a couple? Did you meet at the at the story slam? Yes, we, we did. did. Oh, tell we that did. to the single people. Now. <laughs> single people, you now you know where to go and meet guys. <laughs> oh, we got it. We got a lot of smart men. So people who up at, uh, at, the, at those events, eh? Who needs clubbing? <laughs> No, this is a modern may way to meet a good man, is to go out to a storytelling event and uh, see him on stage and ooh and ow and ask him afterwards, wow, where did you come up with your ideas? Uh -huh. Which is the, st the, the question that writers hate to answer. <laughs> and I'd just like to say, if you want to meet a beautiful, smart woman, uh -huh. where else are you going to go? <laughs> No, it is really interesting having both of us be involved in the performing arts because, like Bryant mentioned, you still get nervous no matter how many times you're on stage. Getting on stage, getting in front of people, public speaking is the number one most feared thing in Western society. And yet storytelling is one of the oldest forms of entertainment. We are still scared when we get on stage and nervous and second-guessing ourselves and thinking we that we're doing terrible and we get up there and we enjoy ourselves it is so much fun mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't do it because they're afraid and they don't realize we are all terrified yes and get off stage and it's like you just 
climbed Gross Mountain. Mm. <laughs> it is so much fun. But how is the audience? Because this is not like comedians. If you go on stage and you don't do what you're supposed to do, the audience is like, boo. Oh, they, no. You know, they, they no. kick you off stage. No. How is the writers, the intellectual audience? <laughs> The Story Slam is a safe place to come and tell a story. Mm -hmm. It really is. I have never yet seen, and, and I've been going to the Story Slam since 2006, I've never yet seen a negative reaction to anybody's story. And I have seen some pretty bad train wrecks. <laughs> and and I'll be That's the first one ones. to say, and I'll be the first one to say that that I've seen some of those train wrecks from standing right on the stage while I'm having that train wreck. <gasps> um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, one of the advantages of going to a storytelling competition like this is that so many of the people in the in the audience are storytellers themselves, or poetry performers, or spoken word artists. Everybody knows. Everybody knows how that it can happen. Mm -hmm. It's a very warm, enthusiastic audience. Even if someone gets up there and forgets what they're doing, or gets freaked out on stage and leaves the stage, and it happens very rarely, they get a warm round of applause. They get cheered if they totally screw up, lose their voice, people snap their fingers and cheer them on. If somebody's obviously having difficulty on stage, they get a lot of support. I've never heard anyone get booed or anything like that. Oh. I mean, if they say something that's really overtly offensive uh -huh. and trying to stir up anger in the crowd, I have heard people get a bit of a grumble from the audience. Mm -hmm. But no, it's really warm, really accepting really loving. Mm. We're all there to enjoy and share. This is um, this is also because you you work uh, you're working on something else um, a video or down the rabbit hole about bullying. Yes that's uh, that's my real life day job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm currently working on a Canada Council for the Arts film project a research film project about youth bullying called Back Down the Rabbit Hole and that I um, did a huge survey of over 600 people who have been involved in bullying, not so much just people who were bullied, but the bullies themselves. And I'm really? currently- Really, the bullies, uh, yeah. they accepted to talk to you? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is around the world, it's all anonymous, it's all confidential, and I consolidated all the information. And I'm currently analyzing to find out why people bully, what we can do to stop that. And one big thing is empathy, being able to empathize with the people around you and mm. connect with them. And so them bullies are people who probably lack empathy? Amongst mostly young people, yes. I think young people are still in a stage of development where they are, by young people I mean people 16 and under, five to 16, they're, they can't be expected to have the same reactions to other people that an adult does who has 20, 30, 40, 50 years of life experience. They're still developing their own personalities and it takes them a little bit longer, a few seconds longer in their reactions to other people to um, recognize that other people are human beings with hearts and souls and the things that they say might be hurting other people. I mean, it's far more complex than that. I'm still working on it, mm -hmm. but empathy is really huge. Mm -hmm. and that's one thing that we have in Vancouver Slam is a lot of respect for each other and warmth and empathy. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is, uh, we're going to take a short break and then maybe you're going to tell me how you bullied the bullies into participating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take a short break. You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uwachu.com to be a guest on the show. Welcome back, my people. We're talking to storytellers and writers. Thank you for being here. So the bullies, the, the whole bullying thing, um, why can't you for, uh, teach people to defend themselves instead of um, talking about, oh, this guy is a bully? If you teach maybe the ones that are bullied how to defend themselves, maybe they will suffer less bullying? That's what a lot of the, the current information is about bullying, youth bullying, and bu bullying in the workplace, in the adult sphere. A lot of the information out there is focused on the target of the bullying, how they should respond to it. That doesn't make the problem go away. No. <laughs> <laughs> it 
if I come up to you and I punch you in the face, uh -huh. and you, over the years of me punching you in the face, you learn how to turn your head so you don't get injured in the face when I punch you, uh -huh. I'm still punching you. But Is it my I responsibility or yours? But what if I learn how to defend myself? If you're bullying me and then I learn how to defend myself, so you punch me, I punch you back, are you going to still come back and punch me? Statistically, yes. I'm really? going to punch you more and I'm going to bring my friends. No way. Yes. Yes. Either statistically, either I'm going to stop uh -huh. completely uh -huh. or I'm going to come back and hit you harder. Because I defended myself. Because now I'm angry or I don't understand that I was hitting you. A lot of young people don't realize I was punching you to begin with. They, they don't realize. They were just like, oh, I was just joking around. I'm sorry. They, ha they don't understand because they don't see they are hurting you. So they don't understand what they are doing. So you can tell young people how to respond to bullying and say don't bully, but they don't recognize it in, in themselves because of the information that's out there in the world, right? So the bully thinks he's just joking around. And then if you react, he's like, why are you punching me now? He feels punched? Yes, yeah. <laughs> A lot of the time with young people, they didn't recognize that they themselves were bullying. They thought they were either joking around or they thought they were just acting like that's what kids do because they that's what they see their peers doing. Wow. So they think it's normal and acceptable. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get anyone coming back to them saying, no, that's wrong, that's not acceptable, they keep doing what they're doing until something extreme happens. Nice. But I'm thinking him, you know, when you're a big guy, you are never bullied. Uh, is there like specific targets for bullying? <laughs> <laughs> like who would want to mess with him? Um. Well. <laughs> Plenty of people. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, speaking of my own experiences, I mean, yeah, I've been bullied tremendously in my life. For real? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I'm, 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 a, uh, I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Really? Mm hmm I mean, you, you're a nice, uh, what? When you have a 110-pound girlfriend who likes to punch you, Bullying has no limits. No limits. What, no limits. What am I going to do? You can't punch back. I can't, I can't physically defend myself in a lot of cases, no. So it's, 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 there's lots of other ways of bullying, too, that aren't physical. Mm -hmm. It's uh, invisible bullying is also a thing. So how did you become the champion? Because right now you are the champion. I thought maybe you were the champion because you work together and since you love each other. Well, he's my like, champion. I'm, I'm going to make him the <laughs> champion, you know, like she had something to do with it. How did you become the champion and what does it take to be the champion? Well, uh, as far as the story slam goes, um, if you win uh, any of our monthly uh, com uh, competitions, if you if you're, get first place in any of our monthly competitions, uh, you have a place in the finals. So in December we have our finals where uh, all of the monthly winners get together and they have a, a competition amongst themselves and the winner of that is crowned the, the champion and I, I won that in 2009 and then I won it again last year in 2014. Wow. So who is voting and can this uh, election be rigged? <laughs> <laughs> You are, you are, you are, you are. Okay, stop you are. bribing yeah. me right now. <laughs> yeah, it's audience vote. Oh. It's a monthly competition, like Bryant said. Um, it's by audience vote. Uh, it's $5 cover charge to get in the door, and with that you get a ballot. Uh, on that ballot, at the end of all the performers of that night, there's about 10 performers every night. You write down your three favorites for first, second, and third. Uh, myself and Rhonda, we get together and tally up all the ballots. The winner wins $75, second place is $50, third place is $25, and the first placer goes to finals. So it's a year-long competition. Oh. And then every December we have our big finals championship, which again, if you're in the audience, you're voting, nice. you're choosing the winners. Okay. So it's by audience vote. We okay. also have prize for best time and line of the night. And secret word. And secret word. Yes. <laughs> How much time do you get? So I'm thinking the best time is the one who can respect their time. Um, in order to qualify, uh, your story has to be between four and six minutes. And it is timed, Rhonda times it. Uh, if it's under or over, under four minutes or over six minutes, you are disqualified, but you still get a round of applause. And we sing to you, we sing a lovely little tune yeah. to all the disqualified people. 
Um, but best time means the person who came closest to five minutes. It's a really arbitrary prize. Mm, so if wow. you are four minutes 58, we give you a prize. Perfect timing, because this is the time to go for break right now. <laughs> you understand the TV <laughs> taping, it's also that few minutes and then you gotta go for the break. Okay, so we'll keep talking about it in our last uh, segment. Thank you so much for being here. You and I talk show with Louise Wachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uwachu.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back and we're coming towards the uh, end of uh, the last segment. Uh, so how can I be part of your show? Let's say I want to participate. How can I be part of your show? Well, track us down. You can look us up on Facebook. We are Vancouver Story Slam on Facebook. Or you can email us, VancouverStorySlam at Yahoo.com. Or if you are already at a show, come up, talk to me, Bryant, or one of the other three, Tim, Rhonda, and Clint. Um, and what I do is I start, start the signups for the next show one month in advance. So we'll have one show about a week after. I open up the call to signups. Anyone who wants to sign up can. Don't need any credentials. Don't have to pay any money. Just contact me, first 10 people. That's the next show. Wow. Very and democratic. Yep. I, I don't. Say. I don't need to know what your story is about. <laughs> I just need to have your assurance that by the time the show shows up, you're going to be there. You're going to be on time and have a four to six minute story in hand. Uh -huh. And we're open to questions. Uh -huh. If anyone has any concerns, I'll send you a link to all the rules. Uh -huh. um, open. No age limits. Our youngest participant this year was 17. Our eldest is, I believe, 70 something. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's not online, mm -hmm. come find me somehow, <laughs> and we'll find some other way to, to get them on board. It's open to absolutely everybody. We've had people who have PhDs. We've had people who um, are unemployed. We've had people who are college graduates, people who have had books published. Mm -hmm. It's nice. open to absolutely everybody. But so you, you don't make money from this? The show self-perpetuates itself financially. We've got it set up to the point where um, the cover charge at the door is five dollars. Mm -hmm. That goes towards the prizes and the actual costs of the show, our supplies and whatnot. Any extra money goes into a little contingency fund, it, just in case once in a blue, very blue moon, we'll have a small show that doesn't cover its own costs. Yeah. But usually, it's a pretty full house. Yeah. But so it's a self-perpetuating financial system. But I mean, like you guys are not in this to make money. You have your money-making job, and you have your money-making. Uh, job project. and this is not like a, a, an entrepreneurship project. I, I don't think where we, I don't think we're going to retire off this. <laughs> this is, I don't know, maybe, maybe a trip to Tahiti. This, no, this, this is done purely out of love and a certain amount of insanity. Yeah, yeah, because it takes so much of your time. I mean, you may be investing money into this. No, no, the, the show the show covers itself. We've okay. got it to the point where the sh it's one of the very few grassroots spoken word shows in the Lower Mainland that we don't put money out of our pocket, and it covers itself. We're very fortunate with the generosity of Eugene at the uh, Cottage Bistro. He gives us the the stage. He books his restaurant so that we can we can have his have our our competition in his restaurant. Uh, so he must like uh, writers. I mean, you need someone he, who probably likes writers. To... He supports the arts. Yeah. He really does. Nice. Yeah, Eugene's lovely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, it's going on until it's every month? Second Tuesday every month at the Cottage Bistro on Main Street in Vancouver. That's 4468 Main Street. Um, st show starts at 8 o'clock. To get a seat in the audience, I'd recommend getting cl there closer to about 7.30ish. Sometimes it fills up pretty full. I've seen people turned away at the door because it's too crowded. Oh, no. <laughs> it's $5 uh, to get in, except for finals. Our finals are December 8th, and those will be $10 cover charge. Nah. So we try to keep it affordable, consistent, second Tuesday every month. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I must mention something about your green hair. 
Mm -hmm. Is that natural? Yes, it's entirely <laughs> natural. Um, because, you know, well, you know, when you were little, your mom tells you you are what you eat. And my mother was a gardener, so she fed me lots of vegetables. And this is what happens. It's actually, I had to dye the rest of my hair brown to, for nice. the show. This, that, I just missed a spot. Yes. I'm very sorry. I so kids, it. like, if kids eat, eat your vegetables, if you want to have a beautiful green hair sometimes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Better the hair than the skin. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, he has no hair. Uh, well, not on my head. <laughs> <laughs> you not you don't miss your hair, right? I know. I not mean, guys least. without hair, sometimes they, they are like, oh, I don't have hair. Uh, not in the least. Not okay. in the least. I actively shave my head. <laughs> I like it that way. Is, I like it that way. Hair is way too overrated. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a nice contrast here, you know. I've got mm -hmm. enough hair for about three I know, of you're us. covering it. <laughs> exactly. She's got all of mine. <laughs> yeah, I stole it and it's glued on to mine. Nice, nice. So, um, if there's something that you want people to retain um, from the Vancouver Story Slam, what is it? You have a story and it is worthy of being shared with the world. People want to hear your story. You are valid. Mm -hmm. Speak to me, mm -hmm. speak to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. So it's like therapy, it sounds like therapy. It is therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> there, but we're not here to be therapists, no. There have been many tears shed on, there's been as much, as, as many tears shed on our stage as there's been laughter. Mm. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for being here. We're wrapping up, and then I'm definitely going to and come and check you out. <laughs> yeah, please do. I'd love to have you in the audience on stage as well. Yeah, I, I, got, I definitely before. have a story. Of course you do. <laughs> you have many, I bet. Thank you so much for having All us, right. Louise. I'm really enjoying this. I'm enjoying this, especially writers. Uh, I mean, this is the, the town, what, what you do in the city. It's, it's a great thing for writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody needs a place to go. Yes. And enjoy. <laughs> All right, my people, thank you for being here. That's it. Stay with us. <laughs>